Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to Episode 16 of Everything Compliance, the only roundtable compliance podcast around. The members of the Everything Compliance roundtable include Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors, head of business development at Affiliated Monitors, Jonathan Armstrong, partner at Quartery Compliance in London, and Mike Volkoff, founder of the Volkoff Law Group. Please note there is explicit language in this episode. Today we take a look at the recently released book by Jesse Eisenker, The Chicken Chick Club, subtitled Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives. In this episode, I'm joined by Matt Kelly and Jay Rosen, and we do a book review of The Chicken Chick Club. We unpack how the Department of Justice got defanged from the prosecutions in the Enron era scandals up through the financial uh, scandals of the 2008 time frame and going forward. It's a fascinating look at Eisinger's book, which is in itself fascinating. Uh, we know many of the characters, and we speculate as to some of the motives behind uh, where this book came from and where it may be going. Uh, I certainly recommend it to every compliance officer to understand uh, the thought process of the Department of Justice, um, whether that thought process will change or stay the same under the Trump administration, administration is obviously open to question at this point. The Everything Compliance Podcast is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox here for another episode of Everything Compliance, the podcast, the only podcast, which has the top roundtable of compliance commentators. We're going to take a look at The Chicken Shit Club, the latest book by Pulitzer Prize winner Jesse Eisinger. It's subtitled, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives. I found it to be a not only timely book, but incredibly entertaining. Uh, I have the uh, privilege of knowing most of the people that he talks about in the book. So I thought we would do our first book review uh, for Everything Compliance. So, gentlemen, uh, with that somewhat long-winded introduction, welcome. And um, I guess, uh, Matt, since you're on the East Coast today, why don't you start off giving us your general thoughts? Sure. Um, well, you know, I I liked the book. I'll start with that. I think that... It's an excellent book. It's well written. It's clear. It is certainly almost a page turner at some points. Um, and it's easy to read. I polished it all off an hour here or there, and I could finish it in a week. And I think it's an important book for compliance and audit professionals to read because it does recount a lot of the history of how we got to where we are in uh, handling corporate investigations, corporate misconduct, dealing with regulators. And Tom, like you said, it's kind of a kick for a lot of us, I think, because we know the people who are mentioned in this book. And there were some bits of their history I wasn't aware of, some I were. Um, but if you go to a lot of compliance conferences, and I have, and I know both of you guys have, you know, like you've met these people and you have this appreciation for it. Now, all that said, there were some points that I thought Isinger glossed over some of the nuances of how things have to work um, or the larger forces that put the DOJ to where it is. Um, you know, he doesn't really talk much about the broader political context that went on in the 2000s or the financial crisis or under the Obama administration. Um, and sometimes I found that he thought you know that so long as we achieve the goal of holding corporate executives accountable which is a fancy way of saying find them put them in jail get them fired if we do that then everything else is great and i am a bit more maybe i i suppose of a constitutionalist that i would like a good steady process that gets us there now if our good and steady process twists and turns as it always does and it gets us to places we don't necessarily like, where some of these people do get off light-handed, um, then you fix the process. But it almost seems in parts in where he's – I was waiting for him to say, enough already. Let's throw a CEO in jail. And um, as much as I would like to see some CEOs in jail, I still am more – it's more important to me that we have a reliable, steady process. And we can get into it. But that, that was my, my top takeaways with the book. 
Jay Rosen. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Tom. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks, Mike. Uh, I kind of saw the book break up into two parts. And the exciting part for me was uh, the beginning part and looking at how the um, Southern District of New York and the SEC and the DOJ um, was able to get more sophisticated in their investigations and develop a certain toolbox on how they could proceed forward. And then, uh, you know, something that uh, focused right on the center of uh, the FCPA world in Houston when they were looking at the Enron matter, um, which ultimately led to the uh, downfall of Arthur Anderson. And the way I kind of look at this is that within the regular uh, criminal uh, system, you have safeguards about, you know, you want to um, try to just just fully convict people or give them their day in court. And then there's this issue about you never want to uh, sentence somebody to the you know death penalty because potentially they may be uh, uh, innocent. And that's the situation that you look at with uh, Arthur Anderson with, uh, you know, company being kind of ripped down, but then coming back later on an appeal, but there was no com company left. And suddenly this uh, desire to want to make sure that you don't do something to an uh, innocent player starts to take more and more in the wind out of the sails of the tools for the DOJ and the SEC. And, um, you know, it's really kind of fascinating to see this difference between the line prosecutors who do the work and the political appointees who kind of float in and float out. So, um, you know, those are my, my general thoughts. And what I thought was very interesting is, you know, how we get this title here, the Chicken Chip Club, and they start off with a speech that James Comey is giving to the um, Southern District of New York and to the new prosecutors who are there. And he asks everybody to, you know, raise their hand if they haven't had a verdict yet or if they, you know, haven't gone to trial. And then he says to them, well, congratulations, you're all in the chicken shit club. And what he meant is uh, that if you don't, if you find a, a case and you think it's relevant and it's good, it shouldn't matter whether or not you're going to win the case, but it should matter whether or not you want to bring the case to trial for the right thing. And um, I'm sure, as we'll discuss over the next few minutes, there are some people who have come in to uh, head up the DOJ who are more concerned with their batting average and statistics than they were when making good cases. And, uh, you know, the disappointing part we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, and especially covered in the financial crisis, is that either the, the cases weren't uh, prosecuted correctly or they just got uh, fallen into a kind of a nice sleepy lull that you can have a DEPA, you can get money from the corporation, but at the, at the expense of uh, individual prosecution. So my take on this was that the um, change in DOJ from the time of the Enron trial, which I think everyone agrees was a great prosecutorial success, uh, up until the financial crisis and up through today was a process. And what I really hadn't fully appreciated was it was a series of incremental steps, which I thought really took away from the uh, ability of the Department of Justice, but perhaps even more importantly, psychologically impacted the DOJ. And I'm going to look to... Um, to Mike Volkoff, uh, perhaps for a little bit more on the psychological part, but um, it was a series of steps. Uh, obviously, Arthur Anderson was a key part of that step, and I'll go into that uh, a little bit more detail later, but also the Thompson memo, and the Thompson memo was the response to the uh, almost dam-busting uh, critiques and criticisms from business groups, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, from my organization, the American Bar Association, as what they viewed as a wholesale attack on the sanctity of the attorney-client privilege, uh, where the Department of Justice uh, actively, um, if not required, encouraged companies to waive the attorney-client privilege in turning over documents. 
And that really, um, the Thompson memo uh, was the memo under which that uh, type of activity occurred. And going forward, uh, they pulled back uh, f- from that with the Phillips uh, memo. And the um, um, it really seemed to have a deep psychological impact. Here in Houston, that was used just um, – very strongly and rigorously by DOJ prosecutors, there was um, the uh, and the other part of it was that uh, the Thompson memo, or at least some prosecutors, read the Thompson memo to allow them to demand that companies not uh, pay for defense counsel of their employees and executives, and that um, and the attack on the uh, perceived attack on the attorney-client privilege. Uh, really drew a, a significant pushback from the business community and the legal community. And the DOJ um, uh, really seemed to uh, uh, take those two critiques uh, very seriously. And coupled with uh, the uh, publicity and PR campaign of Arthur Anderson, I think really led to uh, down the road to uh, where we got into the financial crisis. So uh, with that, kind of, I thought maybe we just uh, throw it open. Uh, everyone takes, um, uh, we can kind of cross-examine each other and see where it goes. Well, I- I'll take the bait there, Tom, since you did um, mention attorney-client privilege. And that was the first point in the book that I get it. And Isinger does a very good job saying turning away from the Thompson memo and its policies and its encouragement of waiving privilege that that turning away from that was a big step in getting us to where we are with this idea that we don't really take corporate accountability as seriously as we should. Um, and he's right that, you know, turning away brought us here, but my thought was, you know, asking any entity to waive attorney client privilege, like that's a big deal. And to insist on it in the way that we have, it struck me as, this is an executive branch end run around a legislative and judicial problem because legislatively and judicially, we have said corporations really are like people. As much as I you know, disagree with Mitt Romney on some things, I see his point when he talks about that and others, you know, that corporations are entitled to a legal defense. Part of that is attorney client privilege. If we don't like that, then pass a law that says it doesn't go that far for corporations, have judges that uphold it and interpret the law that way. But what we had been trying to do with waiving privilege was an executive branch solution to a problem that the legislative and judicial branches kind of foisted on the public and they didn't like it. I'm not entirely sure that waiving privilege is, you know, I, I don't I don't like it. I'm not comfortable with the idea that we should just insist on that. That's a big deal. And it's not necessarily wrong to give pause and think, is this something that we really want to do? And I'll play the cynic. Of course, the Bush administration was going to retreat from it because they are up to their eyeballs in favoritism with corporate America and the big donors. I get that. But nonetheless, this is one of those things where being self-serving and having a valid point happened to align, in my mind at least. And so I, that was one example where I thought it's not as simple as what Isinger was painting. So the, the reason I really disagreed with his point there, Matt, was that uh, if, I can, if I can separate the uh, request away of attorney-client privilege from the um, requirement not to indemnify or pay defense cost for your employees um, – is that I think it's a complete white whale and or, or red herring because you can always the, uh, attorney client privilege does not protect facts. Uh, any facts that are obtained in an investigation, uh, whether it's done under privilege or not, are going to be discoverable. What it takes and requires from a prosecutor or a regulator trying to get those facts is work. And you have to subpoena documents, you have to do interviews, you have to do take depositions, you have to put people in front of a grand jury if it's a criminal matter. And uh, you, you cannot protect the facts from coming out. What you can protect are attorneys' thought product and attorneys' advice to clients. But giving a saying that the attorney-client privilege always protects facts from being discovered, uh, that, that part's just not right. And I think the lesson the DOJ drew was that they now somehow couldn't get the facts and that uh, without um, without doing the, the, the type of di- digging and work to get them. And so for, for that reason, I really thought that 
although that was a large part of his book, I think it seemed to have a more psychological effect on the department. But it was the um, really the KPMG case and uh, Judge Kaplan's uh, scorching of the DOJ for uh, keeping or not defending uh, the KPMG employees. That was a, a huge deal here in Houston because um, the DOJ did that, did that with a couple of other companies down here and uh, got uh, lots of convictions when they told companies if they didn't pull the indemnities for paying for their employees' defense costs, then um, they were going to go after the companies uh, as well. So the companies all cut their employees loose. And that uh, part really seemed to me to have an even bigger psychological impact was just the scorching by um, – uh, Judge Kaplan, if you when you go through the book and looked at the at the end, the lawyer who got scorched so badly, um, he ended up having to leave the United States um, mm-hmm. to take a, take a position, and and I was really stunned by that um, because uh, kind of in my career, <laughs> if you hadn't been scorched by a judge, you haven't been to the courthouse very much, and that's something <laughs> that uh, many of us have been scorched by judges. Uh, some of us have been threatened with contempt by judges. And uh, that just kind of comes with the territory. But uh, nevertheless, uh, those two these factors really seem to me to be uh, psychological uh, factors that really impacted how the DOJ worked up cases to get to the point where they could uh, make a decision on prosecuting or not. Let me let me. Well, I I would also say, uh, um, to your point about psychological impact, I agree. Uh, but your point about not indemnifying or not supporting and covering legal fees of employees, I mean, I, that's another one where you want to turn employees against the corporation at all times. That would be a great precedent to be able to achieve that. And I thought we in corporate compliance world were always talking about everybody moving in lockstep in one corporate culture. We always focus on a couple of key goals. We're all playing on the same team. We all are avoiding silos. If at the back of my mind, I have to worry that the company might cut me loose, even if I'm doing something wrong, because most employees will not understand if they are or they aren't. Most employees will think that they aren't doing something wrong. But if I know that, hey, man, when push comes to shove, company's going to throw me over the side, geez, maybe I should keep these communications extra secret. Maybe I shouldn't be cooperative. All this other stuff, you know. That's one of the consequences of these ideas of pressuring companies to cut their employees loose. And they, like, it's not a consequence to be ignored if we want to talk about all these other Shangri-La views of corporate ethics and compliance and a strong culture. That's part of figuring out how to get there. Right. I think one thing that really isn't to address that we deal with now on a day-to-day basis is – In the book, um, they're talking more about the toolkit that that the prosecutors have. And, uh, you know, if you look at the stuff with Paul Pelletier and he's saying, you know, good things will happen if you you go after an investigation. um, What we seem to be seeing more now in today's environment are whistleblowers. And Mm -hmm. this book looks looks at how the DOJ and the SEC would go after a prosecution. And it was usually. Um, you know, reacted to some type of event, some type of fraud out there. And, um, you know, right now the DOJ really is not making their own cases. They're relying on, uh, you know, the, the defendant's outside counsel to make that case. So, you know, maybe the, the pendulum is swinging back another way because there's more of an opportunity for whistleblowers to uh, at least open up that initial investigation, but then it's still going to be up to uh, the system itself to decide whether or not it's going to prosecute individuals. So the other thing that I wanted to, to go into in some detail was Arthur Anderson. And uh, what I did not know in the book, uh, or did not know rather before I read the book, was that uh, the massive PR campaign put on, on behalf of Arthur Anderson while it was in trial, a little bit before it went to trial, but more importantly, after trial when it was on appeal, that, that to drive home the point that the government was putting Arthur Anderson out of business. And what struck me was um, I had bought into that narrative 110 uh, percent, yet that really were, wasn't the narrative. Arthur Anderson had made a series of um, um, malpractice 
uh, or had had a series of malpractice issues, had sustained some very large losses in terms of uh, settlements and litigations relating to WorldCom, um, obviously Enron, but also others. And it was really on its last leg. And this, the prosecution of Arthur Anderson for document destruction may have pushed it over, but it was falling that way anyway. And so uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, fraud section uh, prosecutors, and, and that case really weighed on their mind. Uh, uh, I think almost all of them said, look, we, we don't want to pe- put another company out of business like Arthur Anderson. So psychologically, that also had a very large impact, uh, as it did with me. But it turned out that that narrative may not have been 100 percent correct. And so um, if you kind of take that building block out, it's, it seemed to me that one of the reasons DPAs uh, came to the fore, uh, were developed and came became so popular was to do precisely that, not put companies out of business, punish them in other ways. So I, th- I found it, if not disconcerting, certainly interesting that one of the, the key components which led to uh, the massive increase in DPAs uh, may not have been correct all along. Well, my thought was um, that Arthur Anderson was another example of where the legislative and judicial branches just didn't haven't really given us the best mechanisms for the executive branch to go ahead and fulfill its enforcement duties. Um, you know, I think the uh, one possible alternative to putting Arthur Anderson uh, under indictment and, you know, how much was that indictment responsible for putting it under or not. But y- we could have ring fenced some of Arthur Anderson's operations that dealt with Enron and said, yeah, all of that part, like a uh, gangrene that's at the tip of your arm and on your fingertips, we're going to take the arm off at the shoulder. Uh, In financial regulation, this is an idea that has been kicked around and tried many different times around the world where you've got a large bank with some series of bad assets on its books that aren't worth crap. You ring fence the bad assets. You put them into a bad bank that the government is going to support somehow, but the rest of the bank is continuing to survive because the rest of the body is healthy and whole. Something like that probably would have been a good idea in this context. And I don't know that it was so much they didn't want to put a big company like Arthur Anderson out of business. It's that they didn't want to put another audit firm like Arthur Anderson out of business. And that, again, you know, that is not something to be dismissed, which is exactly what Isinger did in the book, where he said, well, you know, if we go from the big five to the big four to the big three, then when we go from four to three, what will happen? Well, people will just find their audit clients. They'll make it work. That is such an oversimplification of the problem for CFOs, CEOs, board directors, for the audit firms, for audit regulators. Um, you know, I am all for the idea that the big four are too big. And there should be more of them and they should be smaller. But we are where we are. And to just say that, you know, we'll get over it somehow, somehow would be really painful if we had to go from four to three. It was not a fun job when we went from five to four. It would be a whole lot more painful from four to three. And Carrie Eisinger's uh, arguments to the logical conclusion, you could shut down all four of the big four because they all four have been involved in something somewhere that people don't like. And what, are we going to wind up with uh, little 96 and corporate companies are struggling to find audit firms because we made the, all of the big four go away? Like, we're not thinking through how would we actually make this work? We're just sitting around saying, well, that didn't really work as the way it should. Went, no kidding. Um, but the, the, my, one of my bigger complaints, I suppose, about Isinger's book is that he's really short on how we actually could try and do better other than saying enforcement people should work harder, which, yeah, they should, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. So uh, I guess, Matt, the thing I saw, particularly here in Houston, was the uh, Arthur Anderson partners, they just simply went to other firms. Uh, it's it's the the people, that the company may have went away, but the people just moved to other firms. And whether that was a Grant Thornton or whether it was a PwC or whether it was a uh, Deloitte or uh, whether it was a smaller firm, so uh, most of the partners I knew were able to, um, of course, they lost you know, their equity in the firm, but they were able to move on to other jobs um, without uh, too much difficulty. Um, the, um, 
I guess I, I wanted to point out or at least acknowledge that uh, a large part of the book, maybe the opening 20 percent or 25 percent, really dealt with the success of the Enron cases. And uh, mm-hmm. so there was a point where the department was very successful in prosecuting very high profile. And he didn't even get into WorldCom, um, uh, although I think he did touch on Health South a little bit. But uh, WorldCom, um, Adelphia. Uh, were both very successful prosecutions as well. So we have a template in place. And um, I think if the DOJ maybe went back to that template that they could could have during the financial crisis, I suppose the statute of limitations is, is run now, um, go forward. Any thoughts on that? They, they could, yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying that... Um, we shouldn't that prosecutors shouldn't work harder you know they they certainly should and if they did and put you know persevered like you said with the enron case yeah that worked um i do think however that that is a very painstaking and not necessarily the most productive way for all of society to get through these sort of things um you know we should sit down and think about how could we change the law how could we have judges um, who are going to think more expansively about corporate responsibilities and duties. And Jed Rakoff is a hero at the other end of the book uh, about how we might want to do that. Um, you know, but to grind your way through these prosecutions, yes, you can do it. And the book does not make Lanny Brewer, who was the assistant chief for the criminal division. It does not make him look good because it seems like he didn't want to work too hard to get these cases. But when you grind your way through something, it's still a grind. We have to think about, are there better ways to prevent this sort of misconduct in the first place and better mechanisms to resolve it when it does happen anyways? Um, that's part of, you know, it maybe it's beyond the scope of what Eisinger wanted to do in this book, but that's always where my thoughts are going to be. Well, I think you ought to expand those thoughts into your own book, Matt. Uh, I'd, uh, I'll get right on that, and it will be a fifth quarter sort of uh, project. So, what do you? Th- what are your thoughts, Jay? You've been around um, this business I, for a while. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, as I was reading this book, my um, my sentiments kept going back and forth. So I can see um, both sides of the argument, and you know, what struck me is that. Um, a lot of the stuff that Isinger covered in this book, um, you know, dealt with the financial crisis. And it seems that at the crux of many of these matters, there was sitting uh, one of the big four and one of the big five who, uh, whether or not they were complicit in what was happening, um, they were definitely aware. And I think we need to strike some type of balance that um, – you know, too much of this stuff when we read into and we see um, a DPA or, or an MPA and, you know, the, the, they, they, they don't admit or they don't deny. I mean, too much of this stuff has been uh, accommodations to uh, come up with some type of uh, charge. And right now it appears that the business community looks – at paying a fine or paying disgorgement as just the cost of business. And even on some of these uh, mega millions and billions of dollar settlements, we've seen that when the company pays their penalty and fine, it's only one quarters of income. So I think part, part of what we need to do is to look at what is that fine accomplishing? And then furthermore, one of the points that the book makes a lot of times is that if you're holding the corporation uh, accountable for what they did, ultimately the people paying the fine are the shareholders. So if we kind of go back into you know the whole creation of the SEC and what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to protect the shareholders of the company and make sure they have correct information. And if you have accounting firms who are involved in definitely sins of commission and potentially sins of omission, and you have uh, you know corporations who are involved in that doing that too, uh, ultimately at the end of the day, the investors are paying. So we need to figure out 
some way to protect the investors. And, you know, the thing that really struck me was that whole chapter about Paulson and the abacus funds and the CDOs and that stuff seemed criminal. And for not to have any type of enforcement action there, I thought was, uh, you know, pretty horrific. So I, I think I, I go back and forth, but I'd like to see some type of a combination struck that, um, you know, the, the accountant on the matter should be able to have some type of either whistleblower protection and that we need to really figure out what is the purpose of the law. And right now the uh, purpose of the laws on the book don't seem to, uh, they, they seem to favor corporations and it doesn't really allow us to police the way we want to. And, you know, I know Matt and you go into a lot of this stuff on your into the weeds podcast and, you know, this year the whole thing was about, you know, potentially uh, lessening, taking the teeth out of Dodd-Frank. And that's just another, um, you know, retrenchment in the way that we can kind of police our corporations. You know, I, I think Jay brings up an excellent point about what are we trying to do here? And do corporate penalties really serve a purpose other than punishing past misconduct? But the people who are paying it might not be the ones who actually did it. Um, that a point Isinger doesn't raise, but I think is implied by some of these questions. If we want to have individuals feel the pain, I think the much better way to do this would be to actually punish what they circumscribe, what they can do in the future. So if you are a lawyer or an accountant working at a big firm or a big company, and you wind up getting in trouble for past misconduct, but your fees or your legal expenses are paid by the company, uh, how much does this really hurt? You want to scare the bejesus out of that lawyer or that accountant. Tell them that they're going to be disbarred. They're going to lose their CPA license. And then you're going to be waiting tables. And it doesn't really matter who's going to be paying your legal fees. We won't even charge you. We're just going to take away your ability to make future income. That scares people. Tell the corporate director who is involved in this, you are not going to be able to serve on a company that appears in front of the SEC forever not for 18 months or five years, something like that. These sort of civil enforcement actions that, number one, are going to be a bit easier to prosecute because they're not criminal with such a high standard of evidence. But number two, they really threaten your future ability at any conduct, good or bad or otherwise, not necessarily punish you for previous misconduct. You want people to think about values and ethics and good behavior then? That's how you would do it. And that's the sort of discussion I would like uh, to see this world move to, and if, as a bonus, we wind up we're not stiff and shareholders to pay a fine for something that they weren't responsible for anyways, uh, you know, more power to them there. Well, let me, let me take that thought and maybe go in a different direction because I was really struck by, um, uh, as, I, as I indicated earlier, the Thompson memo and the pushback from the business and legal community around the attacks on indemnifying employees for their uh, defense costs and the attorney-client privilege. And if if we as a nation or citizen group push back, I mean, there are our laws at the end of the day. And if we decide that we want to have more protections around uh, giving uh, employees the right to uh, uh, have, have their defense counsel indemnified and the attorney-client privilege and say, no, you can't uh, violate what we believe is a sacrosanct uh, privilege or right uh What's wrong with, with moving in that direction if that's what the business and legal community want? I, I don't think there is anything wrong with the democratic impulse, good, bad, or otherwise. We've made plenty of stupid decisions as a, as a body politic. We made plenty of good ones, too. But I, I don't necessarily think that uh, there's anything wrong with any of that. I, I just keep on coming back to how would we actually take some of these lessons learned and put them to good use for future misconduct? And I don't necessarily know that you're saying, let's give the prosecutors, let's make them work harder. Sure, we're going to give them more budget. We're going to give them more staff. Now you can work harder and you've got the resources. Or we just you know, flog them and beatings continue until morale improves or anything like that. I, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily the most productive way to get to the goal which we want, which is companies not engaging in bad conduct in the first place. And that's where I... I keep focusing in on. Um, I would point out that something like threatening lawyers with disbarment or accountants with losing their CPA license, I think it's a great idea, mostly because I came up with it. But um, 
in a federal circumstance, the feds can't threaten that because that's not how your licenses get uh, dispensed in this country. You do it state by state. So we don't have the vehicle to do that easily or to make that sort of a threat. And that's where I say, you know, we're lacking some of the mechanisms that could perhaps get us to where we want. And we wind up with an executive branch that good, bad or otherwise, you know, it is where it is doing what it is. But it's not necessarily the most productive way to achieve the goals that we want. Did you really just say the beatings will stop when morale improves? Yeah, you know, there's a <laughs> whole lot of companies where that is the operating culture um, and also in the federal government. But, uh, you know, I think that if we thought more innovatively about how to how to impose the threat of sanction, to get people to behave well in the first place, we might find that there are some very other different sort of ideas about how we could uh, get that goal. I, like I said, you know, a lawyer who's under investigation, but the company is paying his legal fees and it will probably get a deferred settlement anyways. How scared is he of that? But tell a lawyer you're never going to be able to practice law again and you haven't paid off your law school debt yet, or you know, your wife might leave you because now you blew it and that kind of thing. That's a threat. And that is a threat that is preemptive and is going to get a lawyer to think, I am not going to engage in this because I need to screw up my career like I need a hole in the head. That's the sort of thing that gets people to behave well. Uh, fairly harsh. Indeed. So I have some th something to throw out for, for, for the panel here. All right. Um, the, the book only tangentially touches upon FCPA things. Um, you know, towards the end of the book, he talks about uh, some of the, the big matters that are out there and, you know, references Walmart. But do we think that there's a different set of tools or, um, you know, from Matt's perspective, is there a different reason scaring uh, companies straight on the FCPA uh, side of the things? And how do you think that that is either similar or differs from the types of uh, matters that uh, Isinger writes about in this book. So I guess from my perspective, what I see is in the FCPA world, it was really the uptick in enforcement around beginning in 04, 05 led to the creation of, uh, I, I shouldn't say creation, led to the increase and uh, of compliance. As Dick Casson says, I can't say there's less bribery and corruption, but I, I will say there's more compliance in corporations. And so the modern sort of second wave of compliance practitioners, certainly that uh, Jay and I have been a part of, I think, um, and Matt, you've chronicled, uh, came about because of the increase in FCPA prosecutions where it was really a, a process um, a bit, and, and it's become sort of a business process. So I see the prosecutions, even the use of deferred prosecution agreements in the FCPA space is really driving the process of compliance. And as both the Department of Justice, Justices and SEC's enforcement actions mature, company compliance programs mature, and that we're, we're moving toward, towards that, that goal of just more compliance. I I mean I I agree. Um I do think that you know one point Isinger makes is that Lanny Brewer drove more attention to FCPA almost because he didn't have the appetite to drive more attention to the financial crisis and you needed to crack down on something somewhere there's FCPA let's crack down on that. That is an oversimplification of what really happened in the world because the FCPA enforcement was certainly a headache for many companies before Lanny Brewer ever showed up. Um, but you know, I, even if that rather cynical view is true, like, so what last time I checked bribery is a tremendously offensive sort of a thing to do and cracking down on it isn't bad. Um, you know, I think that we can, you know, the Justice Department and society generally, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. If we have chosen just to walk or chew gum at the one time and we're ignoring the other, that's a choice. But if we really wanted to crack down on FCPA and financial misconduct at once, we could. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because we're going easy on financial crime, we're that otherwise we wouldn't be enforcing FCPA. Of course we would. Um, I take issue with some of how Isinger 
characterizes Walmart's misconduct. I don't necessarily know that it is as egregious as the New York Times originally painted it. And I'm not alone there. And I'm not just uh, alone with the Wall Street Journal editorial writers who would think there's no crime at all. There, I knew some very seasoned prosecutors with experience with Latin America who's like, what Walmart did really wasn't that serious of an offense. There are you know, paying somebody to wait around in line to get a license is not bribing a foreign official. And, you know, there are all sorts of allegations there. Um, and Eisinger also describes the Walmart FCPA conclude case is already concluded, which it hasn't. It just it's on the slow road. And I don't necessarily know why. Um, but, you know, all of this. Yeah. So it led to a rise in corporate compliance. What's the problem? What are, I, I agree with you, Tom. This is a good. So. I I don't have any problem with any of that. So if we agree that corporate compliance is on the uptick and companies are being more vigilant, um, why should there still be this division between uh, domestic financial crime and then global FCPA crime? If we want to place some of our eggs in the compliance basket and building it in, I mean, should we be thinking that the glass is half full and this will eventually uh, cross over into non-FCPA and non-global corruption? Or are we thinking that there's too much power on the financial institutions and the accounting and the law firm folks and, and that they're never going to be held to the same accountability that we are holding corporations and individuals under FCPA? I mean, I think they're two different types of crime. And Tom, you're a, either you might know this, Tom, or maybe another different federal prosecutor would know. But my gut is that FCPA crimes are easier to prove than some of these shareholder um, abuse or internal financial statement frauds that we've seen in uh, the financial crisis. Um, they are two different types of crime. I don't know which one is or isn't easier to prove, but clearly the Justice Department of Corporate America have thought FCPA at least is something where it's easier for us to get to a DPA settlement and just kind of make this go away. Is it a cost of doing business or not? Discussion for a different podcast. But, you know, like, I don't know that it's an apples to apples comparison. Eventually, I'd like, sure, the world to get to where the glass is completely full and compliance programs crack down on all sorts of stuff. I think they do. I think, you know, once you're training people that lying about a business act that violates the law is bad, you know, exactly what the illegal act you're talking about is kind of beside the point. It's, you know, lying and covering up and committing it is bad. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, but that's me. So, gents, we're getting up, uh, bumping up near the end of our time, but I was wondering if uh, – you might uh, give a couple of final thoughts and whether you would suggest that uh, someone in or out of the compliance space read this book. And so, Matt, excuse me, uh, we started with you on the on the uh, discussion. So, Jay, why don't you uh, kind of give us some wrap up thoughts from the left coast perspective? Sure. Uh, so I, I don't I think it's a fascinating read. Like like we've both said, it's it's a page turner and it, it really does with some um you know, perspective allow us to look at uh, some of the cases that have really uh, made headlines along the way. And, and I, too, enjoyed uh, reading the names of the people that I've met at conferences. Um, I really haven't seen um, a lot of feedback uh, in the press on this from the folks who they speak about. So uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it would it would probably not be a great conversation to ask Lanny Brewer how he uh, thought about the uh, representation <laughs> of uh, himself and his colleagues. So um, I think from you know people who people who like to read about business and you know like books like Michael Lewis's uh, stuff, you know the Big Short, and I, I think it's a fascinating read. I think it really gives a, a very interesting insight into the agendas of the judiciary and how we really have seen this, uh, you know, revolving door. And it, it was interesting for me because I'm a 
more of a a relevant newbie here to know about, you know, the fact that, you know, Mary Jo White was in uh, private practice first and then she represented some uh, significant companies that were in trouble and then she came over to the SEC. So I'm not, I think uh, uh, I feel a little bit more hopeful about the revolving door because you've got folks on either side and it appears that the government used to be really rigorous and used to um, build up uh, a, a real cadre of folks who could come in and not only prosecute cases, but would be very well aware of what happened when they got to the other side of the white collar bar. And I think there is a little bit of that uh, brain drain happening now. And one of the other takeaways I had from Isinger is that, you know, maybe when the DOJ is staffing up now that it's not such a great thing to bring in all these uh, uh, highly degreed Ivy League folks who have no actual line prosecutor experience. And maybe the DOJ isn't a place to learn, but it might be a place to bring in some more seasoned folks who can help run these investigations in, uh, in a different manner. So uh, those are my things. But I, I think if you have an, in, an interest in this, it's a great fun read and uh, it'll help pass the time uh, flying back from Latin America. Um, well, like I said at the beginning, I, yeah, this is a great book and it's an important book and everybody in compliance and audit, you know, if you take your profession and what we do seriously, it is well worth reading and it's an easy read. Um, I know that I've beaten up Isinger here and there, so I'm going to pick up on two points where I thought he did raise some very valid points. Um, Picking up on what Jay just said, this idea that we have a certain lack of diversity in the Justice Department and SEC and the Southern District of New York in the U.S. Attorney's Office there, um, that you know everybody are these young, very bright, very ambitious prosecutors who are hard charging, and then after a fixed set period, they go uh, through the revolving door and go to the private firm world, and they come back and forth and. I thought it was interesting when Eisinger said we need more geographic diversity, law school diversity, background diversity, age diversity when you've got some retired senior partner who's still in his mid-50s who now wants to become a prosecutor for the rest of his life and he's not in, afraid of a complex investigation. Spot on. Very true. And several of the heroes in this book uh, are you know lifelong prosecutors who did not go through the revolving door and came from very diverse backgrounds who did not necessarily graduate at the top of the class at Yale or Harvard. And I think that's an excellent point Eisinger raised, and I'd love to see that. The other really good point that he raised, again, only in passing, and I wish we could have explored it more, but two things he didn't talk about that much were the Dodd-Frank Act, and the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. He talked about how they exist and what they do, but not how they came to be. But the excellent point that he raised was that compare these laws, which are sweeping and exacting and long and demanding and exhausting, to what we did in the 1930s to set up the framework of securities regulation and corporate governance. Those laws were simpler, sweeping, and empowering, but they weren't necessarily exacting. You know, they would just say that manipulation of stock prices is illegal. What is manipulation? Well, is, and it should be that way. It should be somewhat vague to empower the executive branch to think creatively, certainly because the misconduct people are cre- thinking creatively. Compare that to the Dodd-Frank Act, which was like 1,500 or 2,000 pages and so demanding and exacting and precise and suffocating. Um, and would we, we have been better served with a simpler, more powerful law this time around? Uh, probably we would. And it's a good point to raise that uh, maybe we are not legislating as thoughtfully as we should. In fact, as soon as I've said that, I was like, well, of course, we're not legislating as thoughtfully as we should because Congress never does anymore. But the, those were two points he raised that I thought were well worth noodling over. So from my perspective, uh, first of all, I want to give uh, a big thumbs up to the book. I would suggest anyone interested in law, compliance, uh, business ethics, uh, or business, read it. Uh, I, I read it in three days. I loved it. Um, it really, uh, I'm a process guy, so I was fascinated by the process 
of uh, how we got from something like an Enron prosecution to a uh, not a failure prosecution, but no prosecutions in the financial crisis. Uh, the um, one lesson I would take away from this, and uh, I have learned, is that reading the book reviews, no matter how detailed, uh, really do not do the book justice or a book justice. And so the times in prior podcasts where I cited the book reviews, where they talked about uh, the revolving door or uh, people's going to uh, children going to the same schools as having any influence, uh, those were mentioned in the book, but those were not uh, the driving force of the process I served or or, uh, process I saw throughout this. So uh, I learned a very valuable lesson. Uh, Read the book, not the reviews, if you're going to talk about it. But uh, it's a very good book, and I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, visiting with uh, you two gentlemen, uh, you gentlemen on it, rather. So with that, until next time, this has been the Everything Compliance Gang. We will look forward to visiting with you again. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Everything Compliance. If you have listened to this episode on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast, as it would help get the word out about the only roundtable compliance podcast in existence, and also help in our rankings. Also, we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to develop a to develop a mailbag episode. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Everything Compliance is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network, a group of podcasts that I put together for the compliance practitioner. I podcast several times a day. They are available on my site, uh, fcpacompliancereport.com, J.D. Supra under my name, Libsyn, and iTunes. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Everything Compliance, and I hope you'll join us for our next episode.